This is the final last episode of season 4 already. You're now listening to the most popular episode of previous seasons and my personal favorites. If you're new to the podcast, I interview 20 industry experts in a season on how to grow a B2B SaaS. At the end of the interview, I all ask them the exact same revenue related questions, which are what kind of advice would you give a SaaS founder who's just starting out and growing to 10K monthly recurring revenue? And secondly, how to grow to 10 million AR. In this video, you purely hear the answers from 20 industry experts on how to grow your B2B SaaS to 10 million AR. So it has never been easier to get advice from 20 experts or founders in such a small time frame. There's gonna be three other episodes already, summary episodes, because this is season four already. So if you like this, make sure to check those out as well. But for now, let's just dive right in. In episode one, I interviewed Michael Kamleider on how to bootstrap two SaaS companies to a combined AR of 10 million. I think that's really quite a stretch from 10K to, to 10 million. Like I said before, uh, both of my companies are not there yet. So we are uh, on this on this journey still. Only It's only combined that we can claim uh, we have crossed that threshold. I think especially if you're, let's say, let's put it like that, if you reach uh, the, the million ARR uh, at that, you can fake it easily un- until that point. And by fake it, maybe you don't have a good process. Maybe you have not enough people on your team or the wrong people on your team or not experienced enough people. So to 1 million, I guess you can fake it. If you have a, a proper product, uh, I think you will get to that. But after that, I think uh, you really can't neglect the things anymore that I mentioned. Good processes and having like really good management team. That is the most important thing. If you want to have a chance to get towards 10 million, have a good management structure and find the right people into the right uh, seats. In episode two, I interviewed Jamie Akhtar on how Cybersmart grew to 5 million AR with 20 million in funding. I'd say probably like, the two big things, actually three things. So the first one would be information hierarchy. It's not a technical term. Basically, how do you get information from the team and how do you all take decisions? How do you cascade information down top to bottom, but also how the teams work between each other? Product and engineering, easy one. Product engineering or technology team and your go-to-market team, how do those two areas work together? And I think spend a lot of time iterating and improving how information flows. So it's not just about like presentations or one-way communication, it's all about like tools and mechanisms to create that. I think the, the second big bit, and it's quite, it's related kind of what I'm talking about there, is the culture. I think over-invest in culture because it's something that is so important for attracting people it's so important for retaining people it's so important for change management and change management is happening throughout that whole cycle right you're still going to 10k to 10 million (laughs) there's a lot of change management so investing in culture in other words like why are we here what do we want to achieve what does good look like for us what the shared set of values and beliefs we have as a company and not putting that as a second priority so that's always been something really important for me from day one as well and the third one is more of a personal one, I think, and it actually ties up nicely to what we were saying before. As a founder, you need to constantly look at what you're doing and do less. I think it's something I've constantly struggled with as well, but like focusing on yourself, like you're not gonna get one to two to three to five to 10 if you're always in the weeds, like you won't be able to see it. In episode three, I interviewed Esben Fris Jensen on how user flow grew to 4.6 million AR, which is the team of three. 10 million AR, that's where you should start making your processes more scalable, right? That's where I would advocate for building really strong self-service and product-led growth processes into your company. And I think a common mistake when you're growing towards 10 million AR is you think everything is about hiring more people, which is wrong. It's not about hiring more people. It's about like, how can we uh, adjust the product? How can we adjust our marketing model? How can we adjust the pricing? to grow more revenue. I think that's the most common mistake I see when people are growing towards 10 million AR is they just hire more and more people because that's the idea. The more people you add, the more revenue you're going to have. But I think Userflow is an example of that's not the case, right? You can actually grow revenue without hiring people. So in the early days, focus on getting MR and don't chase VC capital. And in the later days, Focus on getting MRP and don't hire people just to hire people. In episode four, I interviewed Michael Heiberg, getting to know the story behind Ocean.io, 
and being AI first with 10 million in funding. Automation, use AI to automation. There's so much magic in automation. If you throw people at it, we are only 30 people. From a revenue standpoint, we probably represent 90, 100 people, okay? But that is because we are so highly automated. Yeah, and can you give some examples of where a lot of where normal startups maybe spend a lot of time where you have automated things? We have not a single SDR. We have very few AEs. Our revenue is generated entirely inbound. Entirely inbound. We do not do outbound. Uh, everything is automated in t in in, t in terms of uh, we measure to the nth degree the j customer journeys we have and we optimize our product constantly. We have far more engineers than we have will ever have in sales. The product and optimizing the product and the journey for the customer is far more efficient for us than actually having 10, 10 times the sales we have, a number in AEs we got. AEs can be extremely efficient if you channel quality to them. In episode five, I interviewed Vlad Gosman on how Involve Me bootstrapped to a seven figure in AR and his lessons learned. Once you pass the 10K MRR mark, I'm not sure if it's a 10K or whatever the mark is, but move, moving into the seven figure to eight figure range or wanting to hit that eight figure ARR range, I would say this is the place where on the team side, you would go from the generalists to building up teams of specialists. I would still advise to have a few generalists in your team, but to build a, a foundation for specialists, so finding the people who are better than the each generalist that you had in the team before at specific tasks. That's one thing. Then you start building processes, you start going through the motions of, of really structuring everything. And I would say while zero to 10 K might be something where ideally you would find one channel that works, right? Whether it's direct sales or it's Google ads or it's content, or it's just a viral loop. It's one thing usually that you find that really works and that gets you to this first milestone, whatever it is, 10K in this scenario. But on the road from there to the 10 million uh, mark in error, I think it's, it's most of the times an orchestration of channels and uh, measures. And um, I think one thing that people and companies could leverage more is partnerships on the one side implementation partners that uh, maybe tie into your product. For instance, we have 50 plus native integrations to CRMs and uh, marketing automation tools and the likes. These are invaluable channels, but a lot of, uh, a lot of companies don't use them. Next to all the traditional ones that you would know, SEO, content, performance, and so forth. I think there are also some other paths that you can explore on your journey to 10 million era. In episode six, I interviewed Mari Martins on how Tally bootstrapped to 10K MR, which is the team of three. We're not there, <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure. So I guess that's also the part where we have the least experience. So this is actually an interesting journey for us, so where we will probably most likely be looking for advice and, and giving advice. I think starting and scaling is a totally different beast. So I think for us, it will be to surround us with good people. And as you mentioned before, people that we can learn from, but especially also figuring out how you get to that first first step that will, I think, teach you already a lot to tackle the next one. But a good question, actually, because we'll have to discover ourselves along the way. In episode seven, I interviewed Michael Heap on how my Ask AI bootstrapped with a team of two to 300k AR. I think we're going to have to create more content and create more of a brand around the products. I, I still don't think that if you covered up the name of our products, people would be able to tell you that it's my Ask AI. I don't think if you were to look at our copy, people would be able to say that. And I think that is something that is very important as you get towards those kind of numbers. And I think the other thing is coming up with a good way of generating a sales pipeline, specifically for kind of enterprise customers. 
like coming up with good uh, playbooks and practices of, of how you're going to do that. At the moment, we have quite an ad hoc approach. We'll do some outreach, we'll get some inbound, follow up on them. And we're quite good at working closely to close them. But I think coming up with a scalable approach to doing that is going to be the only way that we get to that kind of scale. In episode eight, I interviewed Joe Lewin, getting the learnings of a second time SaaS founder. I think building a solid team, a lean team, <laughs> rather than a large one, is obviously most important at its core and delegating accordingly. I think once you move up into the seven figure revenue range, your founders take a step back. There will be an element of founder led sales, of course, and, and being good at sales is one of the most important skills, I think, for a startup. Um, but really be able to delegate to trusted individuals that are exceptional in, in what they do. That's one of the most important. In episode nine, I interviewed Bridget Harris on how to bootstrap a B2B SaaS to 5 million AR and beyond. I still have to learn these lessons myself because we're struggling to get to 10 million. It's not easy for us. It's not like some flicker switch and you do it. I'm continually struggling on figuring out what it is that I need to do. I actually think it comes down to one thing and one thing alone, which is people. I think you can't even get to 5 million, or you're very lucky if you do without a team of people. And you certainly need a very strong team of people to get to 10 million. And people have different ideas about what they want to do. I would, the books that I've read recently, like Traction, but also Radical Candor, I found very useful. But I think that having a deep investment in understanding how you're going to work with people, what your company culture is going to be like, what your organizational values are going to be like, how are you going to manage a team and how are you going to manage people? So for example, as CEO, I have obviously my direct reports, but I don't spend a lot of time in meetings where I'm helping deliver the work. So I have very strong people who work for me who are delivering the work. And I think that for you to get from five to 10, this is what I myself have learned and been reading about and listening to podcasts is you know, the leader, the leaders, they have to have some time spent looking and thinking about the bigger picture strategically. And if I don't have time to do that because I'm spending, you know, proverbially carrying on doing the support tickets, I would never be able to do it. So it's a dual thing. Your company needs to be resilient, strong enough with very strong people to run the company for you so that you have got that time to, to do the strategic stuff. But also you emotionally you're never going to get there if you're still absolutely in the weeds of the business and that relies on people and people are hard they're they're amazing and also the hardest part of any company so you have to be very good at dealing with people and understanding people in episode 10 i interviewed preston keller on how to grow your SaaS while being sued being lean being smart resourceful but also i would say gratitude realizing that you're only as good as your team the just being grateful for everybody else's efforts. It's like a famous quote. It's like, it's amazing what you can accomplish when you let other people have the credit. Are you struggling to find people and companies which have access to your ideal customer profile? At Redditors, we just launched a second side of the marketplace, which allows you to search, filter, and contact B2B SaaS affiliates, which have access to the audience you're looking for. We do this by leveraging first party data sources. Want to learn more? Go to getreadytest.com. In episode 11, I interviewed Leah Martin on bootstrapping your fully remote B2B SaaS beyond 20 million ARR. Actually, I would probably define that in a couple different tranches. The first would be a million ARR. At that point, you probably still need to do everything on your own. Million to five million, you're starting to delegate some responsibilities, but you are still essentially executing on the vast majority of things that need to be done in the business because you can't afford really good people, particularly if you're bootstrapped. Five to 10 is you at 10 million, you should have no job in the business other than strategists. Because if you are still in the business in any context, every single thing that you're doing in the business should definitely be done by someone who's better than you. And at $10 million, you can afford to be able to hire out all of those different positions to have someone that's better than you. That's why I'm talking to you as an example. It's one of those skills that essentially someone that you're going to interview, you don't want like the VP of XYZ, VP of marketing to be able to come on for time. Doctor, you generally want one of the co-founders of the business in order to be able to do it. And it's just something that I can do during this point 
But outside of like setting mission, vision, and values with Rob, the CEO of the company, and working on PR and then doing some of the research and development, like direction, visionary direction, those are my three separate things that I do inside of the business. I couldn't replace anyone to be able to do those particular jobs. So that's why I'm doing them. And you should extricate yourself from everything else that is mission critical towards the operation of the business. In episode 12, I interviewed Gary Emerald, uh, getting the learnings and advice from a second time SaaS founder. Scalability, repeatability, I think is, is the next part. You know, I think probably an obvious thing should be like at every milestone, there will likely be changes in that process that gets you to the next milestone, right? Like you're gonna win a ton of customers in that first tranche getting to 10K that when you're at 2 million and you're selling deals, you would never even wanna talk to those people that you sold when you were getting to 10K, right? I guess mentally separate the idea of a repeatable, scalable sales process from what the ICP or the persona is, right? Or the price point, right? Like. I guess that's actually the biggest piece of advice. Realize that your price will and should change immensely on this journey. In episode 13, I interviewed Ivana Todorovic on how Arthurdop achieved 3,000 paying clients with their go-to-market strategy. To be honest, we are not even close. So I cannot give advice from my experience, but I can say what we plan to do. We are at the pretty low pricing point. We are at the beginning, first of all, we were targeting only individuals. It's super hard to get to 10 million with a product that costs $20 per month. What we plan to do is to scale and to try to help SMBs. You already have insights from the individuals. Smaller companies probably need something like that, plus additional features. So you are basically looking to get from this 20 to 100 dollars or 200 dollars at least per month from companies you are not looking for enterprises for big companies but if i can sell for example 10 or 20 or 50 licenses rather than one that makes it much more easier for me to reach that goal again also when you are not doing individuals but you are looking for companies you can also prioritize annual plans which are going to help you with the cash flow and then you can reinvest channels in experience in support so that is what we plan to do we'll see how it will go in episode 14 i interviewed karsten matzen on how morning score transforms seo with gamification so since i've never grown to 10 million ar i wouldn't pretend to know we're just south of 1 million so when you get past 10k maybe you need to hire along the way obviously hiring is a whole story of itself it's really hard to do so really be careful there. But in terms of pure growth, how are you going to grow your way there from 10K to let's say 1 million? That's a journey I think I can talk about. Just don't do too many things because I, that's one of the things that slowed our growth was when we were doing ads on five different platforms, SEO a little bit over here and a little bit over there. We did conferences and big things. If you looked at the different marketing tactics you could employ, and, and of course we did sales on top. So we did everything at the same time. And that really costs a lot of money and it slowed the growth from 10 K to 1 million, because it's still not time. You're not going to deplete your market because what big companies often face is that, for example, Google ads, they're, they're like, yeah, it's fine to spend money on Google ads, but there's only so much market. So I'm going to use other channels as well from what 10 K to 1 million, you're not going to run out of market. So just focus. That would be my take on it. I think that's the, just to get there as cheap and as fast as possible is to choose a few good channels. That would be my take. In episode 15, I interviewed Thomas de Klerk on how Lost Most B2B SaaS surpassed 5 million AR with their scaling success. Obviously your MRR level and if at all you choose for funding should permit it, but I would recommend for a lot of founders on the podcast is to think about where do you get the most of your energy from and where do you believe you help your company the most for myself that's also the, the recent transition where we hired a vp sales taking on yeah, the sales team of course and when it comes to the strategy but especially the operational part and then myself focusing on new initiatives i believe if you can and you believe that also counts for yourself for the energy and the value you can bring 
I would rather recommend that doing that earlier than later. And it's beyond the title you hold. I believe you shouldn't keep your VP, C-level, director title just for the title. Look beyond that and, and see where you can bring your company to the next level in the, the best role that gives you the most energy. In episode 16, I interviewed Blake Hutchinson on buying and selling a SaaS, like everything you need to know. So I really believe in lookalikes. So I really believe in understanding your ICP and building out personas. And so if you can understand the characteristics of the people that got you to 10K, you should actually be able to then map the collection of other business owners that, or other potential customers that look substantially similar. And then it's a function of how you go to them in the most efficient manner. And so I would look at various tools. I would look at something like a clay where you can get a user's LinkedIn account, get a user's email account, potentially get a user's phone number, and I would build workflows around that ICP, and I would start to play the direct sales game. And so again, this doesn't mean that you need to become a direct sales company, but if your job is simply to go from 10K to 100K, then it would be a function of how you find more similar and substantially similar customers in the fastest possible way for the cheapest cost of acquisition. And the cheapest cost of acquisition is emailing people and dialing people. And so if you're not willing to email people and dial people, don't become a founder. In episode 17, I interviewed Farzad Rashidi on how to build a startup within a corporate where he built Respona within Visma. When it comes to growing that, I think the first million people take it a lot more they think that this is going to be as hard getting to from 1 million to 2 million and it's never the case when it comes to your first million is the most difficult one and then it gets gradually easier over time and, the, and from 9 million to 10 million is almost inevitable if you've built a healthy business it differs what type of work that you do as a founder and at the beginning you're way more involved in the product side of things in the sales and marketing side of things. And then over time, as you start hiring people and they start, you start delegating a lot of things, then it, you're directing the, I would say the trajectory of the company. Now you're paying a lot more attention to the metrics and trying to deal a lot more with the data. And you're not quite as hands-on with everything as you used to be, but it makes you do a lot more higher leverage activities where you can make a decision in a day that would define the trajectory of the company for the next few years versus at the beginning when you're doing demo calls, not every decision that you make or things that you say are going to have that big of an impact. So that's, again, something that I'm still going through myself. And so by no means I'm a know-it-all. So I'm still learning and making a lot of mistakes, but that's at least observing my co-founder getting to that level. And another thing I found is also it's never, you're never going to be happy with the progress he's as unhappy with everything that I am. <laughs> yeah, not like our level of stress and despair hasn't changed. <laughs> so that makes me feel like, okay, this is not going to go anywhere. It's, it's not like when you reach a milestone, you're going to be like, oh, I hit 10 million. I'm, I'm profitable. Everything's growing so fast. Like look at it from the outside. You're like, yeah, you should be like on a boat somewhere. What are you doing here? But it's couldn't be far from uh, reality. In episode 18, I interviewed David Baum getting the learning from a SaaS founder with more than 25 years of entrepreneur experience. First, to the start of that journey, if you're going to have a chance at reaching 10 million ARR, well, in Europe, that's quite a big number. In the States, maybe not so much. You have to have found product market fit. You have to come to a state where customers, where your GTM works, where there is a steady inflow of, of opportunities, where you can build repeatable processes around that. And before you experience all the indications of PMF, you should still focus on PMF. Otherwise you won't get there. But as you get those indications, the feeling of pull where customers say, I, I want this, please. And, and you start to get inbound and the inbound actually succeeds in becoming or signing up and onboarding, then you have to build system. Some really wise person said that you never achieve success by rising up to your expectations or your hopes of a really successful future. Success is falling down to the level of the systems and processes you've built. So you won't achieve that dream if you focus on that dream. You will achieve 
what you have built systems and processes to support. So that is where your focus should be in order to go from 10K a month to 10 million. In episode 19, I interviewed Rory Sadler on go-to-market learnings from B2B SaaS Trumpet. I'd explore the concept of a customer advisory board. These don't necessarily need to be customers of your product today, but they can also be customers that you would dream of having one day. So we've built one. So we have one of the EVPs at HubSpot. We've got uh, CROs from companies like Calendly. We've got revenue enablement leaders for the likes of Databricks and Gong. These are like dream logos and customers, but they're also experts in their space and their field and their domain. And we're working with them to build Trumpet together. So how do we get Trumpet to become a hundred million dollar company? How do we sell to a hundred million ARR company? What would you want to see? What are the things that are missing? What are the capabilities that you guys are thinking in the next five years? Because when they've got thousands of sellers, for example, we sell salespeople globally, we're, we're aware we don't necessarily know that world right now today. So how can we be aware of it? So in two to three years time, when we're ready to engage with that world, we've had the support and be able to build that in mind. And those people have incredible networks. They have incredible expertise and domain knowledge that you can just tap into. So yeah, we're fortunate to build the customer advisory board that we've got. It is equity based. It's not necessarily how many you have. I think just making sure you do the due diligence on you know, who they are and what value they're going to bring is probably the key piece. In episode 20, I interviewed Dan Asse on building a client obsessed SaaS insights from a seasoned SaaS founder. I think ad advice is always a bit challenging because every journey is uh, different, but maybe to more from a personal perspective, I think it's important when the company grows to ask yourself the question, am I still the right person or am I still in the right role? Maybe I experienced that a couple of times in my career. So back then at my e-learning company found that I was more the person generating new ideas and starting up new things. And for the company, it was better to just focus on the same thing and get into to a more repetitive business motion. So at that point, I already did a bit of harm to the company, but I eventually stepped out more or less still in time. Uh, so my advice would be more like, look at yourself at this stage, because then at uh, growing to 10 million, you already have a bit of your journey uh, behind you. So it's good to reflect on uh, what do I want? Uh, am I still working out of a position of strength? Uh, so maybe that can be a more generic uh, advice. That was it. These summary episodes are my personal favorites as they're value packed. I do have a five second request. Could you grab the device you're currently listening on and just leave us a review for the podcast and give us a follow if you haven't done so already? Would be much appreciated. This podcast is made available by Redditus. I'm the founder of Redditus and we help you to set up, manage and recruit B2B SaaS affiliates which can help you to grow your B2B SaaS. Go check out getreditus.com for more information but that's enough promotion for now. Have a great day and see you in season five.